Good morning, it's Monday and welcome to Sabah's Way of Life. Today's going to be a slightly longer message because I want to share what I did yesterday, Sunday, I didn't get a chance to post yesterday and then just share the meaning of what I learned with you. I'm also going to read um, a little paragraph from a book that I'm reading. I'll share that with you in a moment, which is quite relevant to, I feel is quite relevant to what um, I learned yesterday. So yesterday I was in one of the shires in Middle England and I had been recommended by family, um, a family member to go and learn to shoot from a gentleman who has been shooting all his life. Now, when I'm talking about shooting, um, I'm really talking about the art of learning to shoot. So those individuals that have been shooting um, animals, hunting, um, target shooting, just learning a skill, which once upon a time was perfectly normal. You would go out to shoot the animals that you eat. Nowadays it's slightly different and there's all these different social constraints around it. I'm talking about a skill and it's something that I wanted to learn after I travelled to Scotland with my youngest son, youngest son in December and we had a go at clay pigeon shooting and what I understood from that was that it's a skill that I wanted to learn because there was a lot I didn't know. I I love the fact that you're out in nature. I love the fact that it's hand-eye coordination and it's something that I could um, learn which would help me develop other skills which we as human beings generally have lost from leading a sedentary life in the city. And that's where I keep talking about this in every video that we don't even know what it means to be human anymore. And that will become clear when I read this book. So let me explain what actually happened. You've got to bear in mind that it's not just the act. This is important how you think here because we've forgotten how to think. It's not just the act of, guess what, I'm shooting. I want to shoot something and be good at shooting. No, it's the act of understanding how the weapon works, so how how the gun works. If you're really interested in how something works, I, I will give you an analogy with cooking, but how it works, how it's made, how to hold, how to use certain, for example, which is the dominant eye. I learned something about dominant eye yesterday, how to look at a particular target and first work out before you do anything that which is your dominant eye and there's a particular exercise that one needs to learn how to do and which you know you just wouldn't have known how to look at something with then close your eye the other eye and work out which is the dominant eye many people who have poor hand-eye coordination are probably using the wrong eye because one is dominant over the other so many things to take into account and then when you're learning to shoot as I was so so for example I was learning, I understood the difference between an air rifle, a bullet rifle and a shotgun. What the bullets look like, how they're made, the gunpowder, the balls, how the gunpowder is used as a, pro as a propulsion mechanism. All of these things were important to me because it helps me learn and understand. It's expanding my brain. Not least because you're actually in one-to-one -one communion with another person, especially where I'm concerned, a person of the land. These people of the land who are jack of all trades, they really know how to think. They know how to live off the land. And it was a mind-blowing experience that nobody who lives in the city and hasn't engaged in this kind of activity would even, would even know where to start. They just... They just wouldn't. You wouldn't if you've not got any of the experience. And this is the experience that I'm gaining as I'm spending more and more time outdoors and on the land and now learning to shoot. Not going to a range and shooting, which is what I did, which got me involved, 
but actually having the opportunity to be with somebody who has done this all his life as a way of life. That was the magic. And how the day, how are we doing for time, how the day started was just walking around the 11 acre plot that he has, which is made up of woodland and beautiful ancient Bramley apple trees. I learned that these apples on these old trees, some of them were over a hundred years old, that these apples were naturally sweet. So that today's Bramley apples, which are known as cooking apples, you need to add sugar to them when you're making your apple pies. But these Bramley apples are naturally sweet because they haven't been genetically modified and ruined. <laughs> and so walking through all the brambles, looking at all the different types of trees, I had no idea that these Bramley apple trees are hardwood which are great for firewood as well that they need to be seasoned that much I understand because I've learned about that a couple of years ago and started practicing myself actually in some ways talk to me about an elder tree and how useless it is as a as a, as a firewood or a hardwood then looked at all other trees that he's planting for every tree that dies he puts a new one in He's interested in hardwood. I'll just call him Peter for now, just to maintain his privacy. So Peter was interested in hardwood. And so he's planting oak trees and um, also other fruit trees like plum trees and wild cherry trees. It was wonderful. Then we, as we walked walked through the, the whole area that he owns, he showed me we were with his dog, his hunting dog. This is a hunting Labrador not a dog. He's not somebody who keeps dogs as a pet. They're not pets. Dogs are working animals. So that doesn't mean he doesn't love them, but they're working animals, just as hens I have a livestock. They're not pets, right? He has to give his dog a name so that the dog would respond to him because it's a hunting dog. It's trained to, to do a particular job. Right. So we went out with the hunting dog. It was unbelievable where the, the hunting dog's skill and the sense of smell, which, of course, I learned a lot about the sense of smell with dogs and deer and rabbits. So we saw many, many deer and does and bucks and, um, and many of them lived on his land as well. And we had a look at a lot of fox, fox burrows, which were originally rabbit burrows, and then how the foxes take over and how they move their young to safer places. And then how can they, they can be sniffed out because they are a pest, as you know, especially when there's too many. But everything forms a part of a habitat. The other thing that we did it's absolutely amazing as we went up on a, what you call a high seat and a high seat is if you're looking and you you're looking to shoot um, uh, for example foxes or even pheasants later on in the year then how to assess the land how to assess the landscape I understood how how to follow an animal round how to make sounds so it sounds like a rabbit or something in distress so that they look round and stop all of these things, these are phenomenal skills to have. Um, and then I had a, a, a go at target shooting. And the strangest thing is, the actual shooting side was probably the last half an hour. The first three and a half hours was assessing the land, walking around the land, understanding how guns work, understanding the components, understanding the technique of how to hold, which is far more important than the actual shooting itself. And the, these were not the same sort of guns that you would have on a shooting range, which are very amateur. These are very different guns with the telescopic lens and you have to, you have to, you know, there's a lot more involved. So you can imagine the time taken in learning how to do that. I'm, I've just started, but boy, it was just an exhilarating experience. Now, what I want to show you, the, the analogy is, the exhilarating experience was learning to think in a different way and being out in nature. But what I want to explain to you is, let's talk about cooking. So um, I'm going to give you an analogy of cooking. So if you want to cook something, you want to learn, these days what you're taught is, well, get a recipe, pick up the recipe, look at what's in it, 
if if you're smart enough you'd read the whole recipe first many people don't even do that they just start cooking and following as they go along you'd read it three or four times before you start normally but you've got the recipe and you just follow it and you cook it and if it comes out well great if it doesn't it doesn't but that doesn't make you a cook that makes you somebody who's followed a recipe that doesn't make you somebody who understands food that makes you someone who's just learned how to follow a particular lines on a page and cook something. The real understanding of food and cooking comes when you start feeling and understanding the ingredients and you understand what, what the purpose of each ingredient is, how it affects the food, how when you change its nature, when you cook it, put heat on it, how it changes the flavour, uh, the ingredients and the nutritional integrity of the food. That's what a real cook does. That's what my mother does. Even though she was never taught to, it was experience over time. And it's the same way with Peter learning to shoot. He didn't go on any shooting classes. He learned from his father or grandfather, who were people of the land, and luckily he was able to grow up with them. That has changed now thanks to the state and the system who are deliberately trying to pull families away um, from each other so that they become solipsistic like they are, which is thinking about themselves and turning themselves into God. It's all going to come crashing down very soon. So these are the things that are important. So he, he learned how the components work. He taught himself. I mean, the skills which are dying in today's modern society are incredible. The intelligence he has. I was just observing, spent time in ob observing people just observing him walking on the land and aware of every sound. Sometimes when you talk to him, he notices a buzzard up above or he could see a deer. Even though the deer blends into the landscape, there's so many reeds and so on in that area. And I couldn't see it. I couldn't see, but he could see straight away. This is, it's so metaphorical. You can't see Open your eyes and you will see what you can't see because we are so blind today. It's even written in the Quran where God says clearly to the al kafirun the unbelievers. Most people don't actually know what that means. You have to really study that. Where he says, I will cover your eyes to the ones who are belligerent and say that they believe in God, but their actions don't show it full of words but their actions don't show it just like satan he says i will cover your eyes i will cover your ears so that you can't hear or see anything and you won't have the ability to be able to have this creative open divine thinking and mind and that's what's happened when you when you see these hear no evil see no evil speak no evil actually it's not that it's actually not the whole purpose of that entire quotation is where God has said, I will close your eyes and your ears and even what, what you say, you won't be able to speak with goodness anymore. Most people don't. If you understand what I mean by that. OK, so now what I want to explain is how what we see is technical progress if you really think about it, it's also going backwards. Now, I'm not suggesting that technical progress is wrong or right. I'm just getting you to see and understand things differently so that when you put it all together, you gain a much deeper intelligence. This is a book called The Technological Society by Jacques Ellul. And I have to give the credit of me understanding, knowing about this book, which I'm, I've only just started reading a little while back. Mind blowing. Um, I have to give the credit to Sam Gerrans. And I've shared his details a lot be um, below because I'm reading his translation of the Quran at the moment. But he also is involved in a lot of other work, a very learned person and propaganda for example which is how this whole world works today on propaganda and this book by Jacques Lul was written in the 50s um, and it explains how we have gone from where we were people of God in with a universal mind to becoming progress in quotation marks 
to a technological society where we have forgotten the journey to what we, we learn. So let me just explain, let me just read this bit to you. It's right at the beginning where he talks about it. Now, he's talking about writers, how writers used to write in those days and where their thinking came from. So he says, purely personal reflection and private experience form the foundation of these books, these books the writers used to write. In no sense do they represent an effort at common inquiry or reciprocal control or search for the best method. Moving on, the plan of a book was not laid out with the reader in mind. So what he's what what he's saying here is that when when people used to write in those days, they used to write from their heart and with and share their their knowledge with others without it wasn't a means to an end that I I want to achieve this in the mind of the reader. Yeah, it, think about what I'm saying here. It was not based on subject matter, but rather on personal fancy of the author or on more obscure reasonings. Even men of powerful intellect did not escape these feelings. Now, the next paragraph. A second characteristic of this type of scientific literature, it was scientific, not what we know science today. A second characteristic of this scientific literature is that it attempts to set down in one book the whole realm of knowledge. It is not rare to find in works on law in the 16th or 17th century extended treatments of archaeology, theology, psychology and linguistics, not to mention history and literature. Entire chapters concerned with magical practices or Peruvian sociology may interrupt the source of a book devoted to revenues or to the jurisprudence of the Parliament of Bordeaux. Now, this is talking about an author who has a jack of all trades mind, a generalist mind, because all of that is important to the subject matter that he wants to talk about. You can't just focus on one thing without knowing the holistic view, which now holistic is known as oh, holistic. No, it's so important. It's everything. The amalgam of reflections and miscellaneous bits of knowledge is found in the works of the best authors. It demonstrates the absence of intellectual specialisation. That has always been the problem. The intellectual ideal in those days was universality and it was a rare thing for a judge, for example, to be ignorant of alchemy or a historian to be ignorant of medicine. That was rare. This was, in effect, an extension of humanism, of the universalism to which medieval theology aspired. So in the 16th and 17th century, every intellectual had perforce to be a universalist. He had to have complete knowledge. And when he wrote on a given subject, he felt constrained to put into the work everything he knew, whether it was obviously pertinent to the subject or not. And this was by no means a sign of muddle-headedness but rather of the prevailing search for a synthesised, universal system of knowledge. Now, if that doesn't define the absolute power of a jack-of-all-trades, I don't know what does. This is such an important video. Make sure you watch the notes, uh, you list, read the notes underneath later, and I'll put some links in um, for you so you can research it for yourself. But this is the kind of stuff that is actually going to create and absolutely expand your mind. Which is why only a few of you will be watching this channel in full. Because it's always the few that understand the truth. And this is not just coming from me. This is written in scripture, in the Quran will only ever be the few, the very few. Have a lovely day.